Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Moya Sore Olabinto, and I am the CEO of Monix Consulting Limited. And I am also the moderator of today's Q&A section titled COVID-19 Implications for Persons Living with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities and the Way Forward. This um, webinar promises to be educative and instructive. And I hope that at the end of today's program, you all will have at least one or two key ideas to go home with, which will teach you how to deal with and respect persons living with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Without wasting any time, I would like to give you a rundown of today's program. To start with, I, as a moderator, will give you an introduction to the topic so that you can understand why we have chosen the topic and why we feel like this critical issue needs to be discussed. Subsequently, I will introduce to you my um, amazing panelists and then we'll kickstart the Q&A section proper. Then after that, um, we'll give our audience, you, our esteemed audience, an opportunity to send in your questions using the chat option here on Zoom, and then we call it a day. Um, before I proceed to the introduction, I have um, three key questions that I want you all to think about. These three key questions will help you to have a full understanding of why we want to discuss this and why it is so important. So the questions are this. One, how well have you pulled through COVID-19? How easy has it been? Number two, do you ever think of how easy or difficult life must have been or is for persons living with disabilities, especially those with intellectual and developmental disabilities? And finally, do you think our friends with intellectual and developmental disabilities need us more at this time? Think about these things. So to the introduction, um, a few weeks ago, um, I sat in my bed and I began to think about how COVID-19 has come to change our lives, how COVID-19 has you know, introduced to us or shown to us the existing inequalities in our systems. Now we can no longer go out without wearing our face shields, our face masks. We can no longer go out without observing social distancing by keeping at least six feet apart when we go out to events and programs. Apart from this, um, many of us have um, lost our jobs. Many are depending on our family and friends for survival. Many do not have access to education like before. Many do not have access to healthcare like before. So the question that came to my mind is, how are we supposed to survive? And how are people living with disabilities um, meant to survive? Again, I then cast my mind back to when I was growing up as a young girl in Nigeria. And I remembered a neighbor of mine who has cerebral palsy. Because of the stigma associated with cerebral palsy, most times when this neighbor of mine um, goes out on the street in the neighborhood and then say he mistakenly um, tampers with someone's wares or merchandise, or he just you know, steps into someone's home uninvited, you know, these neighbors sometimes curse him out. Sometimes they call him names and sometimes some even throw stones at him, which is really appalling. Then I began to think to myself, what can we do to help people like him? What can we do to ensure that people like him are well treated? And now that we have COVID-19 in our midst, which we do not even know when it's gonna go away, how do we ensure that they have access to education? How do we ensure that they have access to quality healthcare? Again, I came across this picture that is on the screen um, a few weeks ago when I was looking through LinkedIn and re reading some newsletters. This is the picture of a teacher who teaches autistic kids. So this teacher in particular, um, as you can see in the picture, she um, teaches her kids in a truck. She drives two hours a day to teach children with autism who don't have books or access to the internet. When I saw this picture, I was really moved and I really felt bad. Although on the part of the teacher, I feel like this is a laudable initiative on her part. But generally, I do not think this approach is sustainable. Why? Because sooner or later, this teacher will be fatigued. 
And apart from that, there's a possibility that she will be exposed to coronavirus. And when she's exposed to coronavirus, there's a high probability that she will infect a student, which in actual fact, she's out to protect and out to care for. So without wasting any more time, um, I would like us to, I would like to introduce my panelists to you because they will be the ones to answer all the numerous questions that I have in my head and that I know that many of you also have in your heads right now, especially for those of us who are really passionate about ensuring that our friends and family members who have um, intellectual and developmental disabilities are not left behind. So I would like to introduce my panelists to you now and we will kickstart the Q&A section. And uh, my first panelist here is Professor Ebenezer Jurudaye. Um, Professor is the head of the Socioeconomic Rights Project at the Dula Oma Institute, University of the Western Cape. Thank you, Professor, for um, being here with us today. Um, next, I have with us Ms. Diana Msipa, who is a program officer in the Disability Rights Unit at the Center for Human Rights University of Pretoria. Thank you for Diana. Thank you, Diana, for being here with us today. Uh, next, we have Miss Lydia Mabodi, who is the co-founder of the Pad Act campaign aimed at providing females in rural areas with adequate sanitary wear. Thank you, Lydia. We're happy to have you today. And last but not least, we have Mr. Tabo Magobani, who is a young legal technologist and and Alibaba Cloud Specialist Trainee. Thank you, Tabo, for being here with us today. So without wasting any more time, um, our questions are based on two key themes. And the first is education, and the second is access to healthcare. So we would like to proceed with our questions on education. So the first question that I have here for our professor is for him to describe to us who persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities are, and what are the typical challenges they encounter in their everyday lives. Professor, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, I think it, when we talk about uh, in terms of uh, def defining who a person with uh, intellectual disability could be, uh, the, the instructive thing for us is to note the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and then to note also the African Protocol you know, on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, one of the most recently adopted uh, instruments you know, on, uh, to deal with disability in the African region. Uh, it is very, very instructive for us to know that uh, the CRPD did not specifically define uh, who, uh, what disability or person with disability are in order to avoid the controversy with, uh, associated with definition per se. But if you look at uh, the Article 1 of the African uh, Protocol, it's uh, tried to explain in details what you know, persons with disability who could be regarded as persons with uh, disability, including persons with uh, uh, intellectual disability. And Article 1 mentioned that you know, persons with disability will include uh, those who have physical, mental, psychosocial, intellectual, neurological, developmental, or other sensory impairment, uh, which is uh, which in interaction with environmental, attitudinal, or other barriers, you know, uh, either their full and effective participation in society. So in, in other words, uh, the, 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 the convention, the protocol in Navarra was adopted what we call the, uh, the, the, the social model of uh, disability per se, uh, defining it in, in terms of how the society relates to persons with disability and not looking at merely the physical uh, uh, nature of an individual. So when we talk about people with intellectual uh, disability, uh, that would be uh, people who uh, due to one form of disability may not be able to reason as usually as, uh, normal, as every woman be we do in terms of their cognitive uh, ability, and that there could also be what we call severe or mild you know, intellectual disability. When it is uh, mild, that means uh, such a person will still be able to function, uh, be able to take the decision, autonomous decision uh, by him or herself, 
uh, and but when it is severe, such a person may require a, a, a sort of assistance in terms of for him or he or her to make a, a decision. And it's also very important to know that you know, the convention did mention the, the fact that uh, uh, what recognizes what is called assisted, uh, uh, as a sort of as, as assisted uh, the decision in terms of persons with a severe uh, intellectual uh, disability. One of the challenges and one of the things we have noticed is the, for the society to tend to classify both persons with severe and uh, mild intellectual disability as if they are one, to the extent that people assume that then it's not possible for them to make an uh, autonomous decision by themselves. No, legally speaking, that, that would be wrong by language of the convention, the language of the protocol, and by his recent jurisprudence that has come up to sit to the fact that the mere that somebody is, uh, has a uh, mild uh, intellectual disability does not mean that person cannot take you no know, decision by him or herself. And we've seen some cases that show the fact that there was a case that originated in India where a woman uh, was you know, with a mild uh, disability got pregnant for about the third time, and it was recommended by the doctor that you no know, you know, abortion should be performed on her without uh, a consent because they thought that you no know, she couldn't cope with uh, that pregnancy. And you know, they were about to, to perform the abortion when she, you know, she, she refused and then she did institute an action before the court. And interestingly, the court said that, look, you know, the mere fact that somebody has a mild intellectual disability does not mean that person cannot function that any other human being. That that person should rise to make choices should still be respected. And that's very, very instructive about the decision of, of, of the court in that case. To, 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 I think what's illustrated to us is that the mere that a person has mere uh, uh, a uh, mild you know, intellectual disability does not mean that that person could not you know, take decision by him or herself. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Um, given that you have explained to us now that there's a difference between mild and severe disability, uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities, I was just thinking that, okay, with respect to education, so um, uh, for persons living with a mild um, intellectual and developmental disabilities, do they learn the same rate as those with severe um, intellectual disability or there's a, there's a huge difference? I don't mind if um, Diana can come in on this. Yeah, on mute. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so, I think the important thing to um, bear in mind, there, there are a number of important things. Um, the first is that each person is individual. So each person with an intellectual disability is individual. And even though we may uh, theoretically categorize them as either persons with mild intellectual disabilities or persons with moderate or severe, whatever the case may be, each person will have will be different and will have um, different needs. So in terms of whether or not they learn at the same rate, um, I, what I will say is that they do um, encounter, each individual will encounter various challenges or will have various needs that are related to education. So one of the, one of the sort of core things about all core characteristics of um, intellectual disability in general is that individuals with intellectual disability have difficulties with intellectual functioning. So this in involves things like learning, learning new concepts, um, it involves things like reasoning, it involves things like uh, problem solving, all of which are skills that are required in the process of learning. So I don't think we can quantify as such um, how fast or how slow someone someone can learn, but I think it all depends on the particular person's uh, individual needs. So that's the first thing to remember, that the, each individual is different and unique. The second thing that I think is important for us to remember when it comes to education and any other right uh, relating to persons with intellectual disabilities is the concept that we call reasonable accommodations. The concept of reasonable accommodations basically refers to making adjustments, right? Making necessary adjustments 
in order to ensure that someone can um, enjoy a right on an equal basis with others. So in response to the specific needs that each individual with intellectual disability has, accommodations, various types of accommodations can be provided to enable them to learn um, uh, the curriculum or whatever it is they're required to learn. So um, I related back as well to uh, what um, uh, uh, Professor Ebenezer was saying earlier about the social model of disability, right? So the social model of disability, we're not looking just at someone's internal impairment, but we're looking at their internal impairment in interaction with their external environment. So they may have communication needs, for example, because of their disability or because of the, or because of the internal impairment. However, the, the environment, for example, the learning environment, the curriculum itself, the materials that they use for learning can either hinder them from actually uh, accessing the right to education or it can uh, um, help them to access education provided that they are properly accommodated. So, okay. uh, yes. So... Thank yeah, you, then. We are here for the sake of time. Thank you. Yeah, so I have a follow up question on that. So, with respect to education, for um, whether it's mild or severe, do you think it's important for persons living with intellectual and developmental disabilities to have continuous access to good education, like continuous education? Yeah, so I think it's important for any learner to have access to continuous education. And I don't think there's um, you know, that persons with intellectual disabilities are an exception. I think, you know, the, the, the very definition of the right to education, it, it involves um, accessing it throughout, you know, um, throughout one's, one's learning life. So yes, I do think that there is a need for persons with intellectual disabilities to have access to continuous education. education. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, the next question that I have now is just to, for us to understand how um, COVID-19 has impacted education generally for persons living with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So what are the challenges? Do they have access? If they have access, are there some, um, assist, um, some technological tools that they need to have before they can learn? Because now we know that um, learning for most people has moved online, so you need to have access to computer, internet, and for those who cannot, you know, use regular internet um, computers, they might need some more advanced tools. So, um, Tabo, I would like you to just jump in on that. So, how, how do you think COVID-19 has um, impacted the education of persons living with disabilities in general? Tabo, are you there? <laughs> Okay, um, if Tabo is not there yet, Lydia, can you um, jump on this um, question? Uh, thank you, Monique. Um, I think to be honest, you... Mm. You see, when you're in a person living with disability, with ID disability, um, I like the term that they call them invincible disabilities because mostly these are disabilities that we cannot see with the physical eye. So they're very difficult to deal with. It takes a person a long time themselves to adapt to their ways of learning what works best for them and how to relate with their lecturers or just their basic teachers. So now with COVID-19 having come and everything changing, that student who, who has taken so much time to you know, get to know how to, to be comfortable in their own space, let's say it's a slow student, you can't see that this person is slow just by looking at them. They need to be explaining to someone that, no, I don't get it, I need you to repeat it for me. I can't spell because A, B, C, D. So now they need a new way because of COVID-19, they need to start afresh, recommunicating with their teachers, with the, 
with the units that are that are there for them of ways to to try and figure out how best they can cope what ways they can cope and because of the impact of covid-19 <laughs> Thank you, Lydia. I, I like the last point you made where you said that teachers need to figure out, you know, how best they feel their students can learn and what it can do. Um, so the question that comes to my mind next, um, and I want Tabo to answer this, is how do you think teachers can assist their students with special needs at this critical time? Oh, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, you know, my, my answer is going to be limited uh, specifically to technology because that's what I know best and that's what I work with every day. But really is, I think we've noticed a shift right now. We've been using these technological applications for some time, but right now we've noticed a shift from especially lawyers and law students and law lecturers are looking back to this technology in understanding the extent in how far can this thing help us and what are the dangers and the applications of this thing. But most, but most importantly is the inclusiveness of this technology that is used. So one, one of the points I, I like to raise is it's the element of objectivity that whenever something is proposed, you know, we must not just assume that it's innovation, that it's going to contribute, um, it's going to make a positive contribution. But really the first thing to ascertain is whether or not whatever that is proposed is inclusive to involve everyone in the, in the society and to promote the values and interests of everyone in the society. So in this case, uh, since we are dealing with disability, I mean, for example, um, one of my team, you know, I, I was in this MIT COVID-19 challenge and one of the issues that was raised is was um, the user interface and the user experience of Zoom and it's, and it's, and, and it's, and it's uh, 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 objective in, uh, I wouldn't say objective, but and it's, and it's user interface whereby it does not include people with disabilities, for example, deaf people, you know, who cannot understand the words as, as the Zoom application, which was later revealed that it doesn't have a transcribing, a transcribing section whereby if you, you cannot hear, then you can read the words. So I think one of the major concern for lecturers and law schools to take into consideration is to look back and to look at the applications that are used in delivering education particularly in this case, technology. Thank you, Tabo. So um, I will come back to this um, topic on technology because I want you to tell us maybe there are some um, specialized equipment yeah, that, yeah. that, you know, to use video recording. You, you would, you know, you're the expert, you will tell us more about this later. But the question I, that I- I have a background. Thank you. <laughs> but the question that I want us to move to right now is to know whether um, you know, there are organizations or there are relevant agencies there, maybe in South Africa, maybe you know, internationally, you know, that are working with persons living with intellectual and developmental disabilities to ensure that they are not left behind at this critical time. I know that the likes of the United Nations keep, I mean, they've been responding. I've read a lot of policy briefs on um, COVID-19 um, COVID response, um, especially with relation to people living with disabilities. If, come up with a lot of policy based on what to do, how to do them. But I just want to hear from you, um, starting with Professor, to know what are, who, who are those relevant agencies that are, you know, addressing issues that have to do with the education and access to healthcare for persons living with disabilities and how well they have been doing since the beginning of this uh, pandemic. Uh, thank you very much. I think all, all over the world, internationally, and even in South Africa, we've got uh, different civil society groups, organizations that work to advance the rights of persons with disability, including persons with uh, intellectual disability. So I know that in Cape Town, there are a few organizations I mean, across South Africa who uh, are actively involved in doing that. Uh, we also have some, you know, based, some of, you know, based on some institutions of university that has you no know, specific things to do with disability which also research and advocate for the right of persons with intellectual disability. Uh, we are lucky to have one of our panelists you know, from, the gen uh, from the disability unit at the Center for Human Rights. They are doing very amazing work in, in terms of that. Uh, we, we, I also know that, like I said, that there's international organization on you know, disability rights that also focuses on the right of uh, persons with intellectual disability. 
all of these organizations, these civil society groups, you know, in, in this period of difficult times of COVID-19, they have to try as much as possible to campaign, to advocate for the right of persons with intellectual disability, you know, for the enjoyment of their rights, you no know, right to health, right to education, right to housing. We have seen so many of them making so many, many um, uh, submissions you know, to the government. Uh, in, you know, in, in Cape Town, there were the, the, this uh, civil society group fighting for right to housing for persons with intellectual disability did make a sort of submission to, to the government to ensure that you know, they are not left out in terms of you know, uh, housing you know, in this uh, difficult time. So I think all over the world, you know, we have both you know, in international and then local civil society organization research-based institution that are advocating for the rights of intellectual uh, persons with intellectual disability. So, so thank you, Prof. So thank you so much, Prof. So personally, for me, you know, when I Google um, nonprofit organizations and agencies, and I read a lot of, you know, a lot of book projects, initiatives, like we are doing this, uh, we are campaigning, we are advocating. My question is. <laughs> How is the advocacy translating to the real work? Like, are we seeing the benefits? Are this um, are the beneficiaries beneficiaries really gaining from the campaigns, the advocacy, and all the talks? So, um, I just want to ask if um, Diana can just um, jump in on this to tell us if we are really seeing results. Like, for especially for people living with disabilities, are these campaigns turning to real? Um, quality um, protection for persons living with disabilities. Are they getting the right benefit from it, or is it just about the talk and talk? Because you know, work without action is dead. So we just need to know. Um, if I could just come in on that, um, based on the work I do mostly with females, mm -hmm. I'd like to think that you know the advocacy that we're involved in by creating awareness, mm -hmm. just the awareness is enough to benefit those we want to benefit. And from the awareness, we even get a wider source of funders who then come into our communities and ask and come to our agencies and ask, what can I do to help? It's because of all this advocacy work that's being done. If it wasn't being done, they wouldn't know. So we continue advocating. They come to us, they ask, how can I help? Um, I stay in this particular area. We have a Facebook page that runs and we just post, for example, there's a person in Peter Marisburg, they need A, B, C, D, but you know, because of their disability, they're not able to go out. You get people who come in and say, okay, I'd like to send them money for the electricity. Can I have their meter number? I'd like to collect their medication for them if it's okay. So I think the advocacy and the awareness work we're doing does benefit the people we want to be benefiting at the end of the day. Thank you, Lydia. Um, I have a general question that I'm going to throw um, open to all my panelists so you can answer to the best of your ability. So my question really now is, who should ensure that persons living with intellectual and developmental disabilities have continuous access to good education? Well, I would think that the primary obligation to do that would be the government. Uh, we know that governments uh, often uh, ratify most of those international conventions and its treaties, which uh, obligated them to take uh, proper, appropriate measures and steps to ensure that persons with intellectual disability, you know, have access to education and live a, a dignified life. So the primary obligation to do that would be the government. Uh, but as we all know that most of our governments have not exhibited enough political will to, to do that. So that's more reason why you know, civil society groups, academia needs to keep advocating you know, for the rights of persons with intellectual disabilities to enjoy their rights. Uh, taking this step you know, 
taking up the government, holding government accountable that they live you know, to fulfill their obligations, which they have committed to under international uh, human rights instruments. Thank you, Prof. Tabo, do you want to jump in? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I, I think when it comes to the input that needs to be uh, implemented, I think there are three phases which I noticed. Uh, number one is the tools for learning, and number two is the tools for educating, and number three is the tools for working. So with the tools for learning, it's not only about the students, but it's about the educators and it's about the people who are delivering the education. Number one, what about lecturers who are disabled? You know, can they uh, effectively effectively conduct their duties. And then it's vice versa when it comes to students. Also, when it comes to the work, you know, the work that is done in the general field, you know, how effective that is uh, uh, in making sure that the environment is inclusive, especially in this period whereby we're working from home. Um, uh, I, think, I think also from a developer's perspective, uh, it's, 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 it's a matter of creating an, a situation of agency to the companies who are developing uh, apps who are developing these platforms uh, to, to put a sort of force, to exert force to them, to show them the seriousness of, 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 of including people who are living with disabilities into these platforms. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that is number one is from the de uh, developer's uh, point of view, you know, who are the people who are developing this platform and how much do they know with inclusivity and including people who are living with disabilities. Thank you, Lydia. Thanks. Who do you think should ensure that persons living with disabilities have continuous access to good education? Is it the government? Is it us as individuals? Is it parents? Is it teachers? Who, in your own opinion, should have you know the major responsibility? I, I love that you also said is it as the disabled, right? You know, there's a slogan that says nothing about us without us. So for us to ensure that we have continuous um, educative measures, we need to be there. We need to be to represent ourselves because we know best what we want. So if you include us in these policy developments, if you at least just come to us and ask, what do you think is best? What can we do? Because most of the time you get people who are not affected or infected or disabled in any manner coming up with, maybe as Tabo was saying, with the Zoom, which is a good platform for many. But then when they, came up with Zoom, I wonder if they ever went to a deaf person to see how can we include this deaf person. So it'll be good, just include us, just come to us when you do things for us so that you can have a better perspective and a better understanding of what it is that we need. So we should also be at the forefront fighting our own battle. Thank you, Lydia. That was an excellent point. And I do um, uh, remember from one of the things that I read from the UN website, they did mention the fact that for persons who are, who are deafblind, that they made available, um, I think, video, video, a video platform for them to learn. So most of the teachings were done using um, videos and you know, just to make it easier for them to learn, which is really great. Um, okay, I just want Diana to chip in on this before we proceed to the next um, theme, which is access to healthcare. Okay, so thank you. I, I love the, the answer that the speakers before me uh, have given. So uh, my thought when you asked that question was, the thing that came to mind was everyone. It's everyone's mm -hmm. responsibility the government, policymakers, lawmakers, uh, the education professionals, the community, the parents, the person, the, the learners with disabilities. It's, it's in short, I think it's everyone's responsibility because everybody does have a part to play. Thank you so much, Diana. Um, uh, so that we don't run out of time, I quickly want us to dive into the next um, theme, which is access to healthcare. 
So this is one of the major areas where uh, persons living with disabilities um, have had to um, struggle through this period. And um, I know that here in the United States, um, I may be wrong, but I feel like sometimes healthcare is being rationed. So if you do not have a coronavirus, if your health issue is not critical, you might not have access. You might not have access. So they're rationing healthcare. And I know that if someone with um, disability, especially intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, dis um, plans to go to the hospital and for just for a checkup or to check up if he's fine or not, he might be sent back. He might not really have an access to a doctor who would check him out just because it's not an emergency and it's not a case of coronavirus. So, you know, every day people are being denied healthcare and it's more worse for persons living with disabilities in general. And I know that for many, uh, for those who really need in-person care, Typically, they would have nurses in their homes, or if they're living in institutions, they have nurses who would take care of them on a daily basis. But with the pandemic, uh, many nurses have had to stay back at home to perform their own um, care jobs for their immediate family members because they have children and they also have elderly persons living with them that they need to care for. So our friends with um, disabilities are forced to stay on their own, maybe with their parents or their siblings who might know little or nothing about healthcare or how to nurse them. So the first question that I have on this um, theme is, why is it important for us to focus on access to healthcare for persons living with intellectual and developmental disabilities? Prof? Uh, okay, if Prof I take is- you. Yes, okay. I think uh, it's very important in the sense that already as we know before now, uh, persons with disability, I encounter different challenges in society, including stigma, discrimination, which also uh, compound the, the challenges they face in terms of access to healthcare services. Uh, we know that you know, in terms of uh, uh, physical uh, accessibility, it could be a challenge in, you know, for them to access healthcare services. Even in terms of information accessibility, it could be a very big challenge, especially for persons with impaired uh, hair or, uh, impair their disability, that could be a very difficult thing. So providing, because of the people, persons with uh, intellectual disability may need a special kind of uh, treatment. Uh, so that makes it more imperative for society to ensure that they have access to healthcare services. So it's really, really very important. Uh, you know, when you look at some of these principles here, uh, initiated in the CRPD, is issues of dignity, issues of non-discrimination, these are very crucial principles that relate to access to a care services. And we do know that, you know, like you did mention that you know, sometimes the government policymaker due to lack of resources or uh, trend to rationalize or ration, you know, care services. This could lead to discriminatory uh, practices and has negative consequences for persons with disabilities. So it's, it's really very important that we emphasize, you know, and most of the committee, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural, even the CRPT committee has emphasized that healthcare services should be provided on a non-discriminatory basis and are respecting the dignity of everyone, including persons uh, with disability. So that extent, that makes it very, very imperative because we're talking about dignity, we're talking about you know, the life of people that may be involved, you know, where they don't get access to care services simply because of their uh, health uh, related uh, condition or situation. Thank you, Prof. So based on this provision you just um, mentioned to us, in a situation where someone with disability is denied healthcare, does that person have um, a local standard to, um, ask, to ask that that hospital take care of him? Or can he set up an action in court based on that provision? Do you know? Yeah, definitely. It will amount to uh, uh, a violation of that person's rights, uh, but whether or not that person wants to go to court, you know, it's a different entire procedure that needs to be taken. A lot of factors need to be taken into consideration. You have to consider you know, whether you know, there's resources for you to litigate, whether you are psychologically prepared to go the long route of litigation, uh, and then who and who do you want to sue in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this case. So these are so many factors that one needs to take into consideration uh, before taking up litigation. My, my view is always that litigation should be the last resort when things like this happen. If there are any other 
ways or channels, administrative channels that, for instance, in the healthcare setting, if they have where you can lead complaint, you can do that. Or whether you have human rights institutions that you can write petition to, to explain that what's happened to your situation. And that could be you know, uh, a better way to approach it. And then if after exploring all these avenues, then you didn't, you can't get remedy then. Perhaps you could think about the courts as a means of last resort. And like I say, we know that people with, with living with disabilities also have some challenges in society in terms of access to resources. So we have to look whether you have the resources to do that, or there are some organizations that may be willing to take up the case on your behalf, then you may have to consider that. Okay, thank you, Prof. Um, Lydia, do you think uh, uh, persons living with intellectual and developmental disabilities need constant care? I mean, constant health care, like checking in and then checkups, you know, routine checkups on a monthly basis, or what, what do you think? Not that they need um, constant checkup. They do have like um, checkups set up for them. Some of them go in maybe twice a year or it can be quarterly, it depends, but they do need to get checked up on. So yeah, they should just maintain their checkups despite the COVID. Um, and I do hope that the physicians out there, they do understand that despite the COVID uh, being out there, they can just attend and attend to them quick because some of them, it's not easy for them to be out of the house as well. We have to take that into consideration because most of us um, have underlying conditions. So it's already a scare for a person with disability to be leaving the house and going to the physician. Now then they have to wait long. So I just hope if we have any physicians here on the platform, they can also just, you know, as they do for pregnant women at an airport, jump the queue. Let that person jump the queue so that you calm their nerves a bit. And Thank you, Lydia. <laughs> and that leads me to the next question because I do know that in a country like the United Arab Emirates, um, sometime in mid-April, they conducted home testing for persons living with disabilities, about 650,000 people, uh, because they know that the, um, they might not be able to go out for testing or have access to hospitals. So do you think this is possible in our own local communities? Do you think we should advocate more for that? Because whether we like it or not, anybody can contract this virus. And when they do contract the virus, whether in the marketplace, in church, they go home and they infect their family members and then we continue to spread the virus. So do you think home testing is possible? Is it doable in our local communities? And have in mind that there are some communities that are developing, especially back home in Africa, like developing. So how, how can this be done? Should it be done? Can we advocate for it? And how possible is it? Tabo, you can jump in, or Diana, or Prof. <laughs> Oh, oh, hi, hi, Will. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for the question, man. I mean, I'm gonna add on to what Lydia has emphasized on, especially in the matter of agency and humanizing uh, the experience. You know, um, I think firstly, the most important question is the issue of research, you know, the information that is collected. Uh, right now we're in the age of artificial intelligence. What does artificial intelligence uh, uh, speak to? It speaks to the collection of information to arrive at an outcome. So, you know, they're using these systems to collect data to determine what to improve and what to implement first than the other. So I think it starts from the data that is collected. If the data that is collected is not diversified, if the data that is collected is not um, uh, inclusive of the disabled person, then the problem starts there. The problem starts there. Then we tend to divert into the most pressing issues of our society because we got it wrong from the first instance in the collection of data. Uh, when it comes to testing, I know of Amazon. Amazon, they are they are working on building the biggest testing facility since they have this infrastructure, this huge infrastructure of the company. Uh, that's 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 uh, special speaking on the business model wise. Uh, that's where most of the companies are venturing into, into COVID-19 testing, but I think they're going to charge that, which uh, will raise another question of affordability for the disabled, of affordability for the disabled persons and the disadvantaged people living in Africa and other regions where they cannot afford. So yeah, there is a sense of agency, especially for people who do not have access to certain facilities. Yeah. 
definitely. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay. So I would like to ask a question now with respect to advocacy. Um, our major objective is so that is that we do not want our friends and families with disabilities to be left behind because it's very easy for people to be left behind at this time because even people without disabilities are struggling. The struggle is real. So um, with respect to advocacy, do we think it's really important for us to heighten um, campaigns, um, creating more awareness, you know, for persons living with disabilities and their needs, especially when it comes to healthcare? Diana? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think it's uh, it's it's crucial. Uh, advocacy is crucial, but in the context of a global pandemic such as the COVID nineteen pandemic, I think what is more important is to include uh, persons with disabilities in the response. You know, the people who um, decide how to respond, what measures to to enact in response to the to the pandemic. I think without including persons with disabilities in that process, you can miss a lot. Um, and it's so easy to actually leave you know, persons with disabilities behind and not consider them uh, or their needs simply because uh, they were not involved in the process, in the decision-making process with regards to the, the, the responses. Thank you, Diana. Thank you so much. Um, so, Prof, um, with respect to the stakeholders in the um, in the healthcare sector, or should I say, uh, stake relevant stakeholders that are there with respect to the healthcare of persons living with disabilities, who are the relevant stakeholders, and who should we, you know, really focus on? Who should our di um, advocacy be directed towards? Well, thank you very much. I think uh, the. The advocacy should be as broad as possible, uh, targeting healthcare providers with the providers services, targeting policymakers that makes decision or adopt policies, you know, that responds to the rights or needs of persons with disability in the healthcare setting. Uh, above all, like, we, like uh, Diana did mention, I think the principle of uh, participation is very crucial in terms of uh, addressing the need of persons with disability. Uh, there's this general comments, uh, general saying that you no, know, nothing for us without us. You know, so that persons must be also persons with disability needs to participate fully, you know, in any kind of uh, response to address you know, the the gap, you know, either in the healthcare setting or whatever may be. So I think healthcare providers they need you know we should be a very bad target. Uh, we all know that challenges we face with healthcare providers, even for not for persons who are, you know without a disability, uh, where there's been you know, recent development about uh, women experiencing of stress-free violence and it's become a very recurrent issue. People are really also advocating campaigning against that. And we know also how they react to persons with disability. Persons with disability still encounter stigma, discrimination, particularly in healthcare setting. So perhaps we need more uh, targeted advocacy. You know, that must be complemented with a form of training for healthcare providers in you know, how they respond to the need of persons with disability. In the healthcare setting, uh, target policy maker, decision maker in the healthcare setting. We need to also target that's very crucial uh, because they make decisions in terms of what and what goes on in the healthcare uh, setting. So we need them. Of course, government departments, you know, third department of healthcare, we need to also work towards them uh, because they are very key stakeholder in terms of uh, what happens in the healthcare setting. Uh, private uh, people, the doctors, uh, healthcare providers in private setting needs also to be targeted. You know, so a wide range of people needs to be targeted in terms of how we deal with this issue. Thank you, Professor. Um, uh, so my, all my panelists know that um, at the briefing se um, session we had, I did say to you all that for me, it's my major concern is not about what the government can do or what relevant agencies are doing. We know they are doing their bits, but my major concern as a person and as an in, in, in international development practitioner is what we as individuals can do, what parents can do, what teachers can do. You know, um, like the young man that I mentioned his story earlier, he didn't get a lot of love from the neighbors. When he goes into people's homes uninvited, 
Sometimes they throw stones at him. That happened right in my presence one day and I really felt bad. So as individuals, what can we do to put an end to this stigma that is associated with living with disabilities? I just want to know so that um, our audience here can live today to, yeah. with, with the knowledge of what it can do. So we don't need to just say, oh, the government should do this. We should keep advocating for more funds you know, to do this, to do that. What can we do from our own perspective, from our own angle as an individual and as a neighbor going forward? <laughs> Don't know if I can take this one. Uh, yeah, you can. yeah, anyone can answer you know, this. You know, this is a very uh, fascinating, especially you raise a very fascinating point on what can an individual do. You know, I've, I've, I was speaking to one of my colleagues the other day, and you know what we realize is that people don't have access to information. People don't, don't know. You know, we do research, we do this, we do that, but you don't go back to the society that we come from and teach them. Just go back to the society and book the town hall, have a conference, have the webinar like how we are doing it right now. Teach people, give people information for free. Because most of the time you realize how the society is reacting based on the information that they have or the little information that they have. So especially as, as, as speaking from a student's perspective, whatever that I've learned, go back to the society, book the town hall, have a conference, have a group of young people, teach them about these things, you know, teach them the findings of, the, of your researches, teach them the findings of whoever's researches. You know, I think I think that's that's the issue. That's the issue right now. You know, COVID-19 has accelerated this problem of access to information and access to education in general. So I think as young people, the duty is upon us to go back to the society, to the community that we come from and teach the society and teach the community and teach the young upcoming individuals of whatever that we learned at a particular stage and teach them early. So I think I think it's a very it's a very crucial point, a very important point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I just want to add on to what Tabo was saying. It's it's an appeal to the educators because I'm speaking as a person with a disability, but a student as well. It's an appeal to the educators, avail yourselves. You, you need to avail yourselves and understand that this whole situation we're in is new to all of us. You're struggling and I'm probably double struggling because I have a disability. So I'm just making an appeal for you to avail yourselves. If we say, please explain again, don't be frustrated. That student actually honestly means, please explain again, because they're slow, but you can't see it. As I said in the beginning, that some of these disabilities, we call them invincible disabilities. You can't see it, but it's a disability. So this child can't constantly be explaining to their educators that I am A, B, C, D, so I need extra this. So when they reach out, do avail yourselves to them. It's really important. Thank you, Lydia. Before um, another panelist responds to that, um, I just want to tell the audience that the you can send in your questions using the chat option so that if we have time, we can take one or two questions before we um, call it a day. Diana or Prof, I don't know if you have any um, additions to that. Yeah, um, so, you are that traffic, you see. Sorry. Carry on, sir. Yeah, I was saying that the, just as uh, my colleague have said, it's very important that uh, every one of us has a role to play in educating uh, our families, our friends about this uh, important issue. Uh, we need to keep talking about it. We need to keep making people know that you know uh, it does not serve the society where, where we discriminate or stigmatize persons with disabilities for any reason. Uh, we should we treat them with everyone with respect, uh, which respects people's dignity and human rights, which is very fundamental. 
Uh, and by so doing, uh, I think we pass the message across. It should start from us, you know, which you, you know, if you want to see a change in society, we should be the beginning, we should be change agents, as the case may be, in terms of uh, advocating for people, telling people, you know, educating people. Education awareness is very crucial, it's very critical to everybody in the communities, you know, uh, in, in our religious setting everywhere, you know, we should keep emphasizing the need to or respect the right of everyone, regardless of your social or physical uh, uh, ability, as the case may be. Thank you, Professor. Um, OK, I think um, we don't have any questions yet, but I think we have a comment here from uh, Mongezi Zondo, and he's telling us here that uh, most of the challenges we have are from barriers created by the society. So we need to work on those barriers ourselves. We need to, you know, like through advocacy, through our campaigns, through our own individual actions. And like Prof just said, change starts with us. By the time we put aside the stigma, the stigmatization for di on disabilities, um, things will begin to change going forward. So um, if you do not, do not have any questions from the audience, I just want to do a quick wrap up because we have just four minutes to end this webinar. <laughs> so um, there are four key things that I garnered from uh, my amazing panelists. And um, for, among the critical ones are that um, persons living with disabilities must be included in the decision making process. When you're talking about um, having a COVID-19 response to ensure that no one is left behind, persons living with disabilities must be included in whatever decisions you are making. And with respect to access to education, it is not just for the government to do, it is a collective effort. So access to good education is a collective effort and all hands must be on deck. <laughs> also with respect to health, uh, persons living with disabilities need to be checked on and they need checkup. While it might not be a con might, might not be constant checkup because there are different levels, we have the mild and we have the severe impairment, it's important that they have access to checkups in the hospital environment. And also, um, with respect to what we can do as individuals and as organizations, advocacy is crucial. People living with um, disabilities must be included in the response while advocating, while campaigning, we must ask them what do they want, what, would, what do they feel is important for them in order not to be left behind. And so those should be part of the key points we should include in our campaigns and advocacy. We shouldn't just take up, think about points of the top of our heads, which might not be beneficial to them who we tag the beneficiaries. And uh, last but not the least, um, advocacy should be directed to um, policymakers in the healthcare sector, government departments, and also to everyone in general. So as individuals, which is my key concern, what we as individuals can do, we who are teachers and those who are aspiring to be teachers, we must learn and aim to teach everyone in the community, in our society, in our neighborhoods, that persons living with um, disabilities are human beings like us and they should be treated with respect and regard. And their rights are rights, they're fundamental human rights and these rights need to be protected as well. And then for those who are also educators, teachers in classrooms, avail yourself. Pay attention to what your student needs. And um, if they ask you, like Lydia said, you know, repeat yourself. They have questions, they ask you multiple questions over time. Do not be irritated, do not be angry. Listen to them, they need to learn and they are, they've made themselves available for you to teach them. So it's your responsibility to ensure they learn and they have good education at the end of the day. And then for us all, we should keep talking about disability rights and we must respect their digni their, uh, the dignity of persons living with disabilities. And in closing, I would say that change starts from everyone of us. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like to say a big thank you to all our panelists. Thank you so much uh, for your time, for sharing your knowledge with us. Despite all your engagements, you made yourselves available today. I appreciate every single one of you from Pro, Diana, Lydia, Tabo, thank you very much. And our audience, I appreciate every single one of you. Without you, we will not be here today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for participating. And I want to say a big thank you to the planner of this program who has been with me from the from day one, Advocate Victoria Balogo, my big sister, my colleague and mentor, thank you so much for all your efforts in putting this together. I appreciate you. And 
Finally, I say thank you to God who made it possible for everyone of us to be here for giving us life. We are grateful. <laughs> thank you, everyone. So for those who might be interested in the recording of this um, program, this webinar, it will, be made, it will be available on my YouTube channel, Monix. I think that will be pasted somewhere by Advocate Balogo sometime later after the end of this program. So thank you, everyone. And it's bye for now. Till we see you again. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Hi. Kandikazina Saini. Thank you.